Today we're going to talk about the Old Testament law and we're going to look at six functions that it has and how we can understand it better when we understand the narrative context in which it was given. Stay tuned. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to the Bible Sojourner. Today we're going to talk about one of the hot topics that I often get asked about, and that is the Mosaic Law and the Christian. Except we're going to do it in a different way that I haven't really done on the podcast before. And we're going to talk about the Mosaic Law as it relates to the overarching narrative of Scripture. So when we do this, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of people automatically default to systematizing laws. Okay, and that's where the whole moral, civil, and ceremonial concepts, those categories for understanding law, come from. Now, if you've listened to the podcast before, you know that I don't buy into those categories. Now, we'll eventually review that again because there are a lot more people that are listening to the episodes now, and so there's always a need to repeat some of the information we've had in the past. But I want to approach it from a different standpoint today and talk about the Mosaic Law from the standpoint of why it's situated where it is in the biblical storyline, and more importantly, how that can help us understand the function of the biblical law. And and when we look at these elements, I think we can really understand this to a better degree. All right, so we are gonna be marching through some material here, and I have a PowerPoint if you're watching this online, and if you're not, that's okay. You don't need to be watching it. I'm just gonna give you a brief outline of what we're working through anyway. So when we talk about the Mosaic Law, first we need to specify that we are talking about the Mosaic Law, and in Scripture we often see that the Old Testament uses the term law in other ways. So, for example, when we... Under when we when we go behind the English term law as it's translated in our English Bibles, it comes from the word Torah most often, and that's the Hebrew word that's translated into our English as law, and that comes from the Hebrew word yara, which means to throw something, and thereby it comes to mean to teach something, and so understanding that Torah can have a general use of teaching is important. We see this in a variety of contexts. In wisdom literature, for example, Proverbs 3.1, we have Solomon writing, my son, do not forget my teaching, my Torah. And, and there are other contexts as well where a similar nuance can be found. And the point is, this isn't just referring to the Mosaic law, this is referring to the entirety of the teaching of Solomon in this case, or somebody else. And there's actually a big debate even in the Psalms, for example, where Torah, is that always referring to the Mosaic law or is there an element of this teaching, uh, generic teaching? Obviously it's referring to what God wants, but it's not related to the law itself. So there are places in scripture where Torah doesn't just mean Mosaic law, It also refers to generic teaching. But I will say, primarily, the usage of Torah in the Old Testament is a usage that applies to the Mosaic Covenant and the laws that make up that covenant for Israel in their covenant relationship with God. Now, when we go to the New Testament, we also see something very similar because in the New Testament, we see that the word namas, which is typically the word that's translating Torah, that concept of law, we see that that term is the chosen translation of the the, this whole mindset of the Mosaic law, but it often will refer to things outside of the laws that make up the Mosaic covenant. For example, in the New Testament, we see places like Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus referring to the law and the prophets. Well, that reference to the law and the prophets, most scholars are in agreement that we have there Jesus referring to sections of scripture. 
So the law there would be a reference to Genesis through Deuteronomy. The prophets would be the next uh, section, and then you would have the writings making up the third section of Scripture, which we see in Luke 24. There's a trifold division of the law that way. So this is pretty common. You'll see the the law, the prophets, and the writings referenced in the New Testament as well as extra biblical literature where the law doesn't refer to the laws in Scripture as much as it refers to Genesis through Deuteronomy. We also have in the New Testament a few sections of Scripture. This isn't as common, but there are a few places where the reference to law actually uh, actually references broader Old Testament usage. So you have John 10, 34, which actually in our last episode, uh, somebody asked, uh, well, hey, you didn't talk too much about uh, John 10 and Jesus quoting Psalm 82 because we did talk about the angelic council there. And eventually I do want to talk all about John 10 and how Jesus uses Psalm 82. I think that'd be a great episode. Perhaps we'll do that sometime in the future. So much to do, right? But my point in referencing John 10 here is that Jesus says uh, that this scripture he's quoting comes from the law, but then he quotes Psalm 82. And so obviously it's not that Jesus is failing Awana or anything like that. Rather, he's just using the common language of specifying law, but that's a general reference to the Old Testament at times. Similarly, you have Paul doing uh, the same thing, in essence, in 1 Corinthians 14, 21. He quotes Isaiah there, but then he makes a reference to saying, does not the law say, and then he goes on. So there is a, an idea here where the New Testament uses this generically, and we need to be aware of those concepts. We also have Paul seeming to use the law, the term law, as a generic principle, as a generic principle. And Romans 7.21 and Romans 8.2 are examples of that. And what we see in, in those contexts is that Paul uses the term law, but he's talking about a context where Uh, It's a principle that's involved, not a law that God had given per se. And so there is this element where we understand there's a generic use of law outside of the Mosaic and then a reference to general Old Testament scripture, which uh, both Jesus and Paul use. So the New Testament does kind of give us a little bit of a broader range than even the Old Testament. But I would say, similar to the Old Testament, the New Testament uses the term law, namas, primarily in most cases as a reference to Mosaic covenant stipulations. Okay. Now, the reason I'm going over this is just because I think a lot of times when we talk about law, we sometimes get confused. Because when I want to talk about the law, I specifically am talking about the Mosaic stipulations that are a part of the Mosaic covenant. Now it's, it is something that is unique and separate from a discussion about the the law of God, as many theologians have used that. And so we need to be very specific about what are we actually talking about when we say the law of God. And so I I'm giving this as a preface to the point that we're going to do an analysis here on how the law interacts with the storyline of scripture. Okay. Now in doing that, there's a couple of key questions that we want to consider today. So when we're looking at the narrative of scripture and we're looking from Genesis on and looking at where God intersects with the storyline and gives the law to the nation of Israel, we want to ask a couple key questions. So first of all, when did God give the law? That's a very important question. And we also want to ask, to whom did God give the law? The recipient of the law is a very important part of this story, and we can't ignore that. This is something that's that's very important for us to consider. And then we also want to consider, why did God give the law? Why did God give the law? So those three questions, when did God give the law? At what time? To whom did God give the law? And then why did God give the law? Those three elements really help us, I think, as we assess what's going on in the narrative and how the law then should function. 
we are able to glean some helpful uh, parts from, from considering that. Now, in order to talk about the importance of the when question, I have a quote here that I want to read from Joe Sprinkle in his book, Biblical Law and Its Relevance. I consulted that for my dissertation in a variety of places. He says, the laws of the Pentateuch have regularly been analyzed by themselves without much consideration to the narrative context in which they are embedded. Without denying the usefulness of attempts to systematize biblical regulations, there is also a need to read the laws contextually within their narrative and legal literary frameworks. Okay, end quote. So what he's saying is that we often systematize the laws, and there is some value to that, but what often is missing in our theology, what often misses in, in assessing biblical law, is reading it within its narrative and literary framework. And I think that that's something that as believers we ought to really treat seriously, and so thus this episode. I think that we can actually uh, get a, a very firm foundation on understanding the use of the law if we understand it as part of God's story. All right, so when we think about the when of God giving the law then, basically you're you're looking macro picture here. So not not at the micro detail yet, but at the macro level, what's God doing? Well, everyone understands that there's a creation first. That's the first event that we're told about in scripture. You have the creation event, uh, and then you have man enjoying the goodness of God's creation and relationship. We're not sure how long that is. It's probably not very long at all. And then you have the fall. And in the fall, you have mankind rebelling against God, ignoring what God has commanded him to do. And then you have the consequences of that uh, impacting all of creation. The ground is cursed because of what mankind has done. And so in the cycle of Genesis 1 to 11, we just went through this in our Old Testament studies class at seminary. And Genesis 1 to 11 can be very discouraging because there's not too much good that comes from that. There, there's just a lot of cyclical sin, uh, rebellion against God in Genesis 6, rebellion against God in Genesis 11, a flood that wipes out all of humanity, just a lot of ne negative things going on there. And one of the things that we observe when we watch what's going on in Genesis 1 to 11 is that humanity is completely despicable, wicked, no hope, and only sovereign intervention from God is going to help them. And so in Genesis 12, we have that sovereign intervention where God chooses Abraham. At that point, he's named Abram and then is renamed in Genesis 17 to Abraham. But at this point, God intervenes in the story and chooses a individual from whom is going to come the messianic line. And it is through this family, this special family of Abraham, who becomes known as Israel, they will bless the world. Okay. And so Israel actually goes into Egypt. And people who have heard me talk about this before will know that I call that Israel's incubator status because they go down to Egypt uh, to isolate, to be in an incubator until they hatch into their fledgling nation status, as it were. And so they go down to Egypt, and then God delivers them out of Egypt in response to his promise of grace and solidifying them as a nation. Okay? And this is a very important understanding of the sequence of the narrative and story, because God delivers the nation prior to giving them the law. And I think that that's very important. In fact, I want to really emphasize this because when you when you really think about this, this is where I think a couple of theological errors start to creep in is we associate the doing of the law on behalf of Israel to merit or achieve salvation on behalf of God. And so some people think that the law, keeping the law is is how one attains salvation in the Old Testament or something like that. I've heard that taught in a variety of places, and that's not true at all. God saves the people, and I might add that they don't deserve saving, okay? 
they are engaging in idolatry, we find out. And even when God delivers them out of Egypt, they bring the idols of Egypt with them, we're told in Ezekiel. So it's not as if they merit God's saving. God saves them, brings them out of Israel, out of Egypt in the Exodus experience as, as solely, solely on the authority and the goodness of his plan. So it's not on their merit whatsoever. And then as we see the next phase of God's plan is that he gives the law to them. And in giving the law to them, it is a response or a gift that he gives to his nation, which is which he is forming officially in Exodus 19 through 24. And then you have Joshua where the, you have the conquest and God solidifying and, and ratifying in the book of Deuteronomy how Israel needs to live in the land in accordance with his precepts, etc. So the reason I bring this up is because when we examine the law in its its narrative framework, the law obviously cannot be a means of salvation or grace. Israel is not keeping the law in order to merit God's favor or or attain salvation. That that's if taking the law at face value, taking it within the story itself, Israel has already received God's grace. And so it's we can never interpret it as a way of salvation. The law was, and this is where some people get it wrong too. Even in reform circles, a lot of times people herald the law as some sort of hypothetical standard for salvation. So if somebody, if Israel, or if we could keep the law ourselves, we we would merit salvation or we would be perfect and then we could have eternal life. But we can't, so Christ has to do it for us. But the reality is law was never meant to be related to salvation in such a way. The law was a gift that was given afterwards. And we'll talk about some other functions of it in just a moment. But understanding the narrative framework of the law helps us understand that. And so when we understand the law in its narrative framework, we see that it's not a means of salvation. It's not a means of attaining uh, favor before God in a way of earning uh, deliverance out of Egypt or anything like that, right? Now, I, I will say that the one of the tremendous benefits of the law, and we're going to talk more about this in just a moment, is that the law provides this literary stimulus then in, in this narrative to learn more about the character of God. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but it's it's at this juncture that Israel starts to find out about their God again, uh, having obviously forgotten much about him during their time in Egypt. And when we when we understand this, this is one of the big, big takeaways for future consideration, but I'll bring it up now. The law is inherently tied to the Sinaitic or Mosaic covenant. It's referred to the Mosaic Covenant oftentimes in Christian circles uh, because Moses was the mediator of this covenant. And so God mediates his covenant through Moses. He makes it at Mount Sinai. So it's also referred to as the Sinaitic Covenant because it was made at Mount Sinai. And this is the, the covenant, the contract between Israel and between God, that they would be a holy nation before him, that they would be his holy people. They would be a royal priesthood and that he would be their God. So this is a very special relationship uh, to facilitate uh, how that's going to look. Okay. And I would also say, it's my opinion, we can talk more about this at a different time, that the Mosaic Covenant essentially uh, mediates or administrates the Abrahamic Covenant or or helps fine tune that relationship. Uh, although Israel ultimately fails in doing that. Okay, so let's talk now about to whom was the law given. I think that this is a key discussion point. So to whom was the law given? Well, everyone agrees that the law was given to the geopolitical nation of Israel. Okay, that's, uh, I think, hands down a very non-debatable point. The law was given to the geopolitical nation of Israel. But what some people don't realize, and I think that this is worth discussing is that Gentiles were allowed not to follow certain laws. And the best example of that, now, obviously there were laws that the Gentiles had to follow. For example, a Gentile can't just go into Israel's camp and says, well, I'm not an Israelite, therefore I can just murder people. It doesn't matter. 
you know, I, I have whatever, whatever I want to do, I can do because I'm not an Israelite. No, that obviously doesn't apply. But there were laws that, is, that the Gentiles were allowed not to keep. So, for example, Exodus 12 in 43 through 49, we read about the prescriptions given to Israelites and Gentiles regarding to the, the Passover. And I think it's important to note that in that text, you have God specifically telling the Gentiles among them, or he was telling the Israelites, but for the purpose of the Gentiles among them, that they didn't need to keep the Passover. Uh, They didn't need to be circumcised. But if they wanted to keep the Passover, they did need to be circumcised. And so I think that that is a key component there of understanding, okay, some of the Gentiles didn't really need to keep the Passover. Uh, they, they weren't required or obligated to do that. But if they did want to, then they must be circumcised and all the males in their household. And so I think that that's a important principle, which we could talk about other laws as well that Israel wasn't or that Gentiles weren't bound to. There, there are There is an understanding in the Old Testament law that there are sojourners there are aliens who live among the Israelites, and they are not bound to the Israelites. They are not strictly a part of that nation, okay? And so there is a difference between the proselyte, the one who completely embraces Jewish identity, versus the one who is uh, a wandering sojourner living amongst the Israelite people, all right? So again, the law is primarily for the people of Israel, and the Gentiles were not bound to it to the same degree that the Israelites were. The law also, and I think we talked about that in previous episodes as well when when we're talking about some of the theonomy issues, but we'll talk about more of that in the future as well. The law provides the necessary insight into how Israel must live with a holy God in their midst. So again, God did not make his dwelling with any of the Gentile nations. And so the law provides insight, again, talking about the holy character of God. Uh, The law provides this insight into how Israel must live in light of the fact that they were chosen by God to have his dwelling in their midst. And so they need insight into, okay, how do we as a nation need to function given the fact that God is going to be in our midst? Okay, so now we want to really talk about where what I think ends up being the crux of the issue and really what what becomes most important for all of us is why did God give the law? And ha- knowing what we know, uh, now I think when we address this issue of why did God give the law, we can assess the function of the law uh, relatively um, helpfully. We can, we can understand it in a better way and then also glean going forward into the New Testament how we should understand the law today, which we won't talk about today, but we at least have the foundation for it. So why did God give the law? So I'm going to give uh, six functions of the law. So when we look at Old Testament picture, and there may be more, but I think six is a good round number, I suppose. So the first thing when we understand Old Testament law is that the law functions as a covenant document. We'll talk more about that. Second, the law is intended to distinguish Israel as a geopolitical ethnicity and function as their constitution. And then third, the law manages sinful situations. So these three, these first three out of the six, basically go together. Number one, the law functioning as a covenant document, that is crucial to understanding number two and number three because number two talks about how the law was intending to govern geopolitical Israel and function as their constitution. Like we, we really need to understand there's a context to how the law uh, functions. And so we, when we understand that, we maybe even can understand some of the laws that are given and why they're given and how they're kind of strange to us at times. And then third, the law manages sinful situations, again, relating to the fact that you have a covenant relationship between God and between the nation of Israel Therefore, when there is sin in their lives, how are they to manage and mitigate that sinful uh, consequence or those situations? And so the law gives helpful guidance on that as well. So then number four, the law reflects the character of God. We've already talked about that and we'll discuss these more. And then number five, the law reflects God's creation design. 
And this is really, really helpful. We'll talk more about that as well. Number six, the law was given to increase sin. So these six, number one, the law functions as a covenant document. Number two, the law is intended to distinguish Israel as a geopolitical ethnicity. Number three, the law manages sinful situations. Number four, the law reflects the character of God. Number five, the law reflects God's creative design. And number six, the law was given to increase sin. So when we look at these six functions of the law, these answer the question as to why was the law given? Well, these, and perhaps more, I'm not going to say this is exhaustive, but I think that these do a good job of summarizing the our understanding, giving a key understanding of why the law exists for Israel in their place and time, right? And primarily, we do have to understand primarily it is a covenant document. And so that's that's what we need to talk about now. When we think about the law as a covenant document, the law clearly, clearly highlights the Decalogue as prominent in Israel's law. Okay, what I mean, the Decalogue is just another name for the Ten Commandments. Uh, Oftentimes, well, in Old Testament studies, scholars often refer to them as the Ten Words because it's not just Ten Commandments. They're supposed to be Ten Principal Guidelines. These are the Ten Foundational Realities, so they call them the Ten Words. And so the law clearly highlights the Decalogue. Uh, In Exodus 25, 16, Israel was commanded to put the ark of the testimony in or put the put the commandments in the ark of the testimony that I shall give you. And then later on in in Exodus 40 verse 20, we're told that he took the testimony and he put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. So what we're talking about there is that these these testimonies that God has given as foundational realities for Israel's covenantal understanding and relationship to him, they are to be front and center to Israel. They are kept in the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's it's a symbolic gesture. It's, it's a constant reminder that these are foundational to our relationship between God and between Israel. And so what that means when we think big picture and when we think of structure of the covenant, and this, this is a crucial component. I've talked about this in the past before, but when, we've talk, when we talk about the law and how the laws operate, not every law is functioning the same and laws are weighted differently in their structural component in the covenant. So the Decalogue, the 10 words, form what what we could call the general stipulations of the covenant. And what I mean by that is those are the, the foundation, the, those are the constitution, those are the, the undergirding realities upon which all the other laws are applications, if that makes sense. So in an illustration that I often give here, maybe you've heard me give it before, is that when we have when we have the United States Constitution, I know some of you are listening from outside the United States, but in the United States, the Constitution is the governing law of the land. And so the Constitution, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of assembly, the right to bear arms, all of that is in American DNA. Uh, it's supposed to be. That is, those are the principles, the the laws of the land. But then how that works out in everyday life is supposed to be adjudicated by the judicial branch in uh, case law is what we call it. And so case laws that are passed down by the judicial branch are specific applications of constitutional principle applied to everyday life. Because we have technological advances today, we're not sure, or, or our technological advances we have computers, we have cell phones, we have uh, electricity. We have so many things that did not exist when the Constitution was written. So how are we to understand free speech on the Internet? How are we to understand the ability to send spam emails? How are we to understand? You know, that is those are legitimate questions. Right. And so we want to we want to understand that there is a need to apply constitutional principles to everyday life. 
And so that's that's how Israel's law code actually functions. So when you examine the structure of the law code, and I want to uh, really emphasize here that this is this is found both in Exodus and Deuteronomy. In Exodus 19 through 24, you have essentially a broad general outline of a covenant document that exists in other ancient Near Eastern documents as well. Uh, in fact, these these treaty documents are often referred to as suzerain vassal treaty documents. And I think that there's definitely some strong parallels there. And what those documents would often include would be a historical prologue, some sort of preamble, and then general stipulations, specific stipulations, some sort of witness statement or provision for reading, and then blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. So when you see these elements being given to uh, to the Israelites in that kind of order, you say, hey, this is probably more than just coincidence. And so you look at Exodus 19 through 24, you do see those elements present. And even more so, I would say you see it in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy follows that structure essentially to a T, where you have the preamble, historical prologue, general stipulations, specific stipulations, blessings and curses, and witness stipulations as well. And this is important because it just shows that God is revealing himself in covenantal language, which was recognized during that time period. This was a recognizable uh, covenantal relationship which other nations would have understood. Israel would have been well aware of the, these kinds of relationships. And so you have Israel existing in this, in this relationship with God. And what this also helps us understand later on is why some, law, some laws are different in their function. That doesn't mean in their authority, but different in their function. Because you have the Ten Commandments given in a specific context. And like I said, those are the foundational realities for Israel's existence, their constitution. And then so you have something that says, you know, thou shalt not murder. Well, thou shalt not murder is is just a law. But really the principle behind that is that you should value life, right? And that value of life leads to all sorts of laws uh, regarding even the city's uh, refuge for manslaughter to preserve life when it's not necessary to take it in capital punishment, all of that. So there are lots of laws which relate to these principles. And you get some books like Leviticus that that follow different structures, but they still relate to the, the principles that are behind the Ten Commandments. And so we could talk about that in a later episode. But one of those things that we need to really understand is that because the law is structured so clearly as a covenant document, we have to understand that's what's going on. It's not just random. This is this is a very clear covenantal relationship between Israel and between God. Okay, now the second thing, besides the fact that the law is a covenant document, we've definitely emphasized that, is that you have the law functioning to maintain a strict geopolitical and ethnic identity for Israel. Now, you actually see this throughout the law, in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, you have God saying, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 7, 6, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So again, there's an exclusive choice that takes place between God and the nation of Israel. And then Leviticus 20 26, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So again, there's a uniqueness that is given to Israel. Now, how this plays out in some of the laws is that God gives laws to keep Israel separate from the nations around them. You have laws referring to intermarriage. Those are to keep Israel separate, obviously. Uh, Israel needs to maintain a distinct ethnic identity or else they lose the messianic nature of their mission uh, to preserve the line through which the Messiah is going to come. But you also have laws like clean and unclean laws relating to 
food? Well, what's the what are the purpose of those laws? You know, you study the, that issue in the Old Testament. There are so many, so many theories and hypotheses about why these laws are given. I just think it's very simple. I think the food laws are given primarily. I'm not saying there might be other reasons, but I think primarily the food, the clean and unclean laws are given in order to maintain a distinction between Israel and the other nations. Because if you're observing those food laws, it's impossible to have deep fellowship with others. Because if the other nations are eating a certain way and you can't eat that way, then you can't eat with them. And if you can't eat with them, then you can't have a relationship with them in the same way that you would have with other people. And so I think that that is the primary means uh, that clean, unclean division is helping keep Israel distinct. If they maintain that, it's helping keep them distinct from the other nations. And so keeping them as a geopolitical ethnic identity. And the reason this is important, people don't think that this is that important, but you see a lot of like the Philistines. Uh, it, it's really interesting. The the Philistine identity, they we see from DNA evidence. There have been a lot of studies over the last few years about about where the Philistines came from, and and we see that they come from the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea up there. And so yeah, that that doesn't surprise us. That's what the Bible had where they said they'd come from. They were seafaring people. They come down. They invade Israel. But what we're told is that within a matter of a, a few generations, just 100 years or so, you have basically the Philistine DNA completely intermingling with the Canaanite DNA. So there's, there's very little distinguishable about a Philistine after a while. And so it becomes more of a cultural identification than, than actually a a true identity of ethnicity or anything like that. And so that's what what probably would have happened to Israel as well. Uh, you see that happening in Genesis 38 before they go down to Egypt. You have Judah intermarrying into the Canaanites. And so I think that gives us the answer as to why God brought Israel to Egypt, to keep them separate until they were ready as a nation to be self-sufficient. And so you have a lot of things going on, and I think the law does function in some senses to keep Israel uh, a separate geopolitical ethnic nation. And then you also have the law functioning. This would be the third point. The law also helps to manage sinful situations. So this is, I think, an underappreciated point at times because we often think of the law as just telling us uh, what, what is best in the sense of, okay, this is what's right and wrong. But the reality is that the law also assumes that people are not going to do what's right. And so the law gives managerial guidance in less than ideal situations. Laws that would include uh, polygamy and um, manslaughter, I think those kinds of laws would, would be included in this. So in Deuteronomy 21, for example, People often appeal to this saying that the Bible supports polygamy because in Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17, it says, if a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. And then it goes on saying he must acknowledge who the real firstborn is. And you might say, well, look at that. That is license to polygamy. So God obviously supports polygamy, and so we should too. But, I mean, the way I say it is that the law doesn't always say what should be, but it also it, it doesn't always say what should be, but also what to do when it's not as it should be. So in other words, even though, even though, Polygamy is not ideal. I, I do take the view that polygamy was was always wrong. Now, I know some people would disagree with me on that, but I think this kind of law isn't saying this is okay to do. I think it's saying that if this is the case, then this is how you need to handle it. And, you know, there are lots of laws like that. This This law is formulated in what's called casuistic style, which means if this, then that. And, and in other laws, that's found as well. If a man kills another man, 
then this takes place. Well, that's obviously not sanctioning that situation. It's just saying that if this situation does occur, this is how you need to handle it. Okay, so that is an important understanding is that just because the law includes something doesn't mean that it affirms that this is good, right? And so the law does help manage sinful situations, whether it be situations like murder, manslaughter, polygamy, all these different scenarios, war. Uh, Deuteronomy talks a lot about war and how to act in those situations. And so these these are helpful to understand. The law functions in a variety of contexts. And all three of these, these, these first three, the law being a covenant document, the law functioning to create a separate ethnicity for Israel, and then managing sinful situations, obviously these functions of the law are intimately related to Israel as a nation. And so I don't think there should be much debate on that. But fourth, uh, in a more general sense, obviously it still relates to Israel, but in a more general sense, the law does reveal God's holiness. And when we look at the narrative, so reading through the book of Genesis, you definitely see God's holiness described. Absolutely, you see God's holiness described. But the law defines it. So narrative describes God's holiness, but the law defines it. And it tells us exactly how holy he is. We, we can say, yeah, God is holy, but you don't realize how holy he is. He, he is so holy that you need to slaughter your goat because you did something that was wrong. And God can't just say, oh, that's okay. And, and he is so holy that you need to go outside the camp and bathe uh, a certain point every month just because y- you cannot... In, in your uncleanness be associated with a holy God. There, there's a constant reminder, a constant lesson, which reveals God's holiness. And it's really, really helpful in, in discovering that through the law. And it also reveals that, that holiness is costly, that dwelling with God does, does come with, with a price. Nadab and Abihu uh, figured that out really quickly. They thought they could worship God however they wanted, and that didn't work out so well in Leviticus 10. All right, so that's the fourth and the fifth. The law reveals God's creative design or creation design. And this is something that's super practical and helpful. Again, each of these functions of the law are not necessarily found in every single law, but many of the laws reveal God's creative design. The Decalogue, for example, uses creation language itself in formulating the principles, the 10 words. And so when we look at that, we can read and say, okay, hey, as I'm going through this, as I'm going through this and, and marching down the 10 commandments, I, I can see, okay, there's language that reminds me that God is a the creator. Therefore, he is the one only that I am to worship. There are no other gods before me. Okay, what about number two? Well, because God is the creator, because he's created everything, we are not to bring parts of creation and elevate them to the status of God. We are, we are not to bring God to the status of creation, and we're not to bring parts of creation up to the status of God. We see that all over. And I think that those kinds of language ideas are, are important because even conceptually they're found there with the idea of stealing adultery, all of those are for, formed on the basis of God's created intent for the world. God created mankind to work and therefore be a recipient of the product of his work, therefore taking what somebody has without license, without without justly being compensated. Those are all wrong because of how God created the world, right? And so and that's what I'll just say this because I think it's really helpful for application. I know some people will get mad at me for saying this, but that's fine. You know, people get mad at me for everything. But I will say one the reason that it's wrong to steal is not because God said thou shalt not steal. As a as a commandment, whether that commandment existed or not, it would be wrong to steal because of how God created the world. Same thing with murder. Uh, I, I like to tell people, was it was it wrong for Cain to kill Abel, or was he fine because because there was no law against it? And see, that's the reality is is that the law actually uh, 
doesn't determine whether something is right or wrong on the basis of, you know, explanation. And really what we're talking about here is the Ten Commandments as being the foundational revelation of certain things that are found in the created order. And so it's it's an interesting thought process to think about that. But how did Adam and Eve know what was right and wrong? How did Cain and Abel know what was right and wrong? How could Cain justly be condemned for his actions against Abel? Well, I think it's it's there there's a there's a good thought process there understanding that God has created the world to function a certain way and so we can understand and apply that in our lives. All right? So the Decalogue when we go through that it does give us insight into uh, how God created the world. It, it's not limited to the Decalogue as well. I should say that it also is expanded to other uh, sections of Scripture. We see that uh, reflected in certain laws as well, and so we want to be sensitive to that. Uh, Sabbath is an easy ex- example of that. Uh, I've given examples of the first two commandments, uh, stealing, adultery, murder, but the Sabbath as well has a connection to creation. Now, we'll have to do a podcast on the Sabbath in particular because I would advocate that the Sabbath is no longer binding on anybody. And so you, you don't have to observe the Sabbath. However, some people would say, well, look, it's, you can trace the Sabbath law to creation. So why wouldn't it be binding? Well, we'll talk about a different time. So there you go. Have fun with that. But the big point is that in the function of law, the law does reveal God's creation design. And then lastly, this is number six, The law increases transgression. This is an underappreciated point for sure because a lot of people don't realize that the law was given by God for the purpose of increasing transgression and trespass. So Romans 5.20 is a a good verse for that as a foundation. Obviously, all these verses are debated, but I'll just give you what I think about them. So in Romans 5.20, you have the explanation there. Paul says he's just been talking about Adam and Christ and the interplay as Adam is the representative of humanity, Christ is the representative of humanity. And so you have Paul saying in Romans 5.20, now the law came in to increase the trespass. And of course, the immediate reference there is the trespass of Adam. But what Paul is saying there, just to clarify, is that the law was given, and and this is important because the Jewish audience would have been wondering, well, how does the how does the law relate to what you're talking about, Paul? And his point, Paul's point here, is that the law came in not to mitigate the trespass that Adam had done, but to expand it and to increase it for us to really understand just how sinful we are and to show us that we violate it so often and to really exemplify that violation, to to expand it. Let's put it this way. Because we are sinful, because we are we are depraved in our in our heart when we are unregenerated, when we when we don't have the ability to obey, when we understand the law, we don't by nature obey that. We can't obey that. And so now the law came in to increase the trespass. God did it so that the trespass would increase. And this you may say, well, that's so strange. Well, it's not unique. I mean, there. this is spelled out other places as well. Later on in Romans 7, 7 through 25, uh, I put here especially verse 10 because I think that verse 10 really exemplifies this idea that the law is holy and righteous and good, but when you, when you examine the outcome of it, humanity is incapable of obeying it, and they ultimately fail. So in Romans 7.10, the very commandment that promised life proved, proved to be death to me. And so it's one of those concepts where, yes, the commandment looks good, but we die every time. It's an increase of sin and death. And again, this is a great example why um, increase of, of law, when we're talking about what scripture has done. And I think this would apply even to trying to hold somebody to a new Testament standard, assuming that we're not obeying the old Testament standard for a moment. But no matter what, if you give God's instruction, you give God's commands to an unbeliever, it's just going to increase sin. It's not going to actually help them. Right. I mean, I think we just need to acknowledge that this is, this is an important point theologically is that 
the human heart by nature is a rebel against the things of God. We suppress the truth about God in unrighteousness, we're told, and sin causes us to to rebel against God, to violate that. We're told by Paul in Romans 3.20, through the law comes knowledge of sin. Galatians 3.19, which is similar to 5.20, Romans 5.20, Paul says the law was added because of transgressions. And so the, these these principles, these this, this Pauline understanding of the law is very important. And this is what we refer to the law as the didactic function of the law. Um, it's the pedagogical function of the law. It, it guides us and helps us to understand our sin. And Schreiner has a really good quote in his book, 40 Questions About the Christian and the Law, I think it's called. And He says, the purpose of the law, it seems, is to enclose all under sin and to increase transgression so that all will see that salvation is only available through faith in Christ. So what he's saying, in essence, and I think this is a really good way of saying it, is that the law is given in a way to trap people, to show them that they are sinners and that they need a savior and that that savior only comes through Christ. All right, so then a couple more things to just really validate this because if you're if you're tracking tracking with this well, you understand that that if if this is true, Paul seems to be saying the law functions in a way to actually actually increase our sin by providing opportunity for sin by by manifesting the fact that we aren't capable of o- obeying it uh and and Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 3 you know if we're tracking with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 7 through 18 in verse 6 specifically Paul says for the letter kills but the spirit gives life so there he's contrasting the mosaic covenantal experience and the new covenant experience so the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. There's a contrast there. These are two different covenants. The Mosaic covenant cannot give life. In fact, just for a moment, I'll uh, I'll give a I don't know an excursus here, I suppose. But the thing to remember is that when when we go through the the covenant discussion, Mosaic covenant versus New covenant, all of this. It's different when you're talking about Pado Baptist versus uh, Credo Baptist. I acknowledge that, but most people, I think, would acknowledge that the Mosaic Covenant has a, a unique function to it. It's a, it's a unique function, and the I would say the big big takeaway of the Mosaic Covenantal function is to teach people that teach teach us everyone. Uh, primarily through the relationship of Israel and how much they struggled, that human beings at their core are incapable of obeying God. There needs to be some sort of divine intervention. Israel was given so many times, so many opportunities, and they 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 just were incapable of obeying. And they tried to have confidence in the law. They tried to embrace it, but the law always killed them. The law always brought them to their knees. And so... The law was primarily given, and I think this is one of the, if I had to pick you know, a primary function of the law, this would be it. The, the law is given to Israel to teach them just how badly they need God's grace and mercy and divine intervention because they are incapable of keeping the law. The law itself is great. The law is fine, but the human heart is incapable of obeying it. And so we need Christ. That's what we call the pedagogical use of the law. And Paul actually talks about that saying, we are bound under the law until the fullness of time when Christ comes. And when we are under, uh, when we are under the law, we are in need of a savior. But now that Christ has come, the savior has come. He has, he has instituted the new covenant. We are no longer under the law, but under grace. He says, uh, we are no longer bound by the the law we are no longer under the law but we walk by the spirit he says in galatians 5. so uh another verse here i just want to really reference is first timothy 1 8 through 11 because that's all always brought up in the discussion of paul and the law and what i just want to read it here so 
in Paul's discussion of the law in 1 Timothy 1, he says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. All right, so when when Paul is saying that there in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11, basically the key phrase at the beginning would be, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, but the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. Now, you could take this one of two ways, and really both are possible. I lean more toward what we've already been talking about. So on the one hand, you could interpret this as saying, well, look, the law is good for the sinners because it restrains them from sin. It keeps them from sinning. And there may be a practical or a pragmatic truth to that, but but not at its core because the law doesn't actually keep people from sinning. It just keeps them from sinning in the ways that they want to sin, but they're still sinning. They, they sin in their hearts. They sin in what they want and desire, and they're still going to find ways to sin. And like what we were just talking about is that the law is uh, producing and showing us and revealing the true depth of our sin. So it doesn't make as much sense for me to see Paul here saying that the law is good for sinners because it keeps them from sinning or whatever. I, I don't think that that would be the right way to take it. I think this coincides with what we've been talking about earlier, where Paul is saying, listen, the law isn't isn't given for for good people. The law is given to show bad people just how sinful they are. So the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. In other words, those people who are ungodly need to have it revealed to them just how sinful they are. And so that, I think, is a helpful understanding of this text. Now, could go either way, I acknowledge that. But again, I think that this is another affirmation of what's going on in the function of the law is that, according to Paul, you have the law being given to increase sin and to cause that uh, sin to have its full knowledge and understanding. So so the law functions in a very real sense, in a very powerful sense, as our best teacher because the law allows us to see just the true depth of our sin. All right, so basically we have these six functions of the law. Uh, and I think that understanding the law in the Old Testament context allows us to see those. So the law functions as a covenant document. And because the law functions as a covenant document, the big takeaway, and I would humbly submit this to you for future reference, we'll mix this into a future episode coming up, but I know it's hard to grapple with this sometimes, but my proposition to you would be that if the Mosaic covenant is done away with, then so too the law code, which is bound as part of that covenant, would be done away with. That seems to make sense from the narrative because the narrative, God already has a relationship with Israel, but then he adds something to that relationship, a law which had not existed prior to that, right? He had already saved, already selected, already been working with the people, and then he gives them a law. And as part of that law, he expects them to live a certain way. And if that covenant goes away, then you would expect there to be a different kind of relationship. And so the new covenant relationship that God has would presumably be different in some instances. And we know it has to be, right? It has to be, uh, given a variety of prophecies and discussions about what the new covenant actually means. And then also the law is intended to distinguish Israel as a geopolitical ethnicity. So it preserves their ethnic identity. It manages sinful situations. The law reflects the character of God. The law reflects God's creation design and the law is given to increase sin. So where the law reflects the character of God and God's creative design, uh, it actually becomes really helpful and easy to apply the law because the principles behind those laws 
can still be very easily assimilated into our own lives. And maybe in a future episode, we'll talk more about what that might look like. But I think when we're when we're assessing these realities, I, I just really want to emphasize that don't just compartmentalize the law as a special document without a context, because understanding that the law came in to the story at a certain point, and then understanding what the Bible talks about with regard to the ramifications of that law and its eventual passing away. I mean, the author of Hebrews says the, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, is obsolete and passing away. That's what he says in in Hebrews 8. So there's got to be real ramifications for what that looks like. And so we will continue talking about this issue in later episodes, but I always get lots of questions on Mosaic Law, so hopefully this is helpful to some of you who are interested in it. I think the law is just such an incredible field of study and something we really ought to meditate a lot on. So I hope it's helpful for you. I am currently at the G3 conference. If you are around, I hope to be able to meet some of you. I know some of you uh, have reached out planning on going to that, so I hope I can say hey to you and enjoy some time of fellowship. If you want more information about me, you can visit peteryaman.com. You can reach out to me through the contact form on my website. You can also visit shepherds.edu to find out more about Shepherds Theological Seminary where I teach. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.